Hi guys, this is gsnon.com and I'm here with a handset called the Allview V2 Viper X. It's a locally integrated version of the Johnny eLife S Plus. So it's a fresh handset from what I know the Johnny eLife S Plus debuted in December. So uh, pretty much these days. As I said before, it's the Allview, which is a Romanian company, the Allview version of the eLife S Plus and it's called the V2 Viper X. This phone costs $303 in Romania, the country where all view comes from, and it's slightly tweaked from the Johnny version. The Johnny one has 3 GB of RAM, this one has only 1.5 GB of RAM. Other than that, the specs and size stay the same, and as you can see we got the gold version of the phone, that's pretty shiny. Okay, so it's a mid-range, youthful handset. It also has an USB Type-C port at the bottom and uh, I'm not very sure but if I'm not mistaken it may be the first Johnny phone with an USB Type-C port. What's for sure is that it's the very first Allview phone with an USB Type-C port. So the colors, it comes in gold, white or dark blue, it's a 5.5 inch phablet and it measures 7.2 millimeters in thickness. Uh, which makes it a bit slimmer than a related model, the Allview V2 Viper, that measures 7.85 mm. In case you want another comparison, it's basically 0.1 mm thicker than the iPhone 6S, so pretty much the same thickness. It weighs 155.3 grams, which means it's very similar to HTC Desire 820, that weighs 155 grams. Um, other than that, we have a plastic case or a plastic lid here, also pretty solid metal frame made of an alloy of aluminum and magnesium. This uh, part of the case is glossy and a bit slippery, also a bit of a fingerprint magnet but not very bad. The frame feels pretty solid and uh, in spite of being a phablet, it's reasonably easy to use with a single hand like I'm doing right now. It's a comfy phone and at the front we find the front camera, earpiece and sensors as well as the notification LED. The bezels are okay, not too thick, not too slim, and we got the three capacitive buttons here below the display. At the back, there is the main camera and the flash, as well as the speaker, very well camouflaged below the logo, and uh, this back cover can be removed, obviously. It's uh, not very easy to remove, and also not very easy to put back on, as you can see. Many of those little attaching mechanisms, those clipses that you can hear right now, will be very hard to put back. Interesting pattern here, removable battery, there is one of the SIM slots, the other one and the micro SD right here, and the small speaker here that seems to be very well protected. Okay, now comes the hard part. Even though you think you placed it properly, throw out the review and throw out the following hours, minutes or days, you find the odd clips that's not yet fixed properly. That's why it's a good idea to check all the edges. Okay, now we continue the analysis of the size of the phone, the Johnny eLife S Plus in the Allview V2 Viper X version. At the top, there is the audio jack. At the bottom, the USB Type-C port and the microphone. Nothing on the left side. Or on the right, we find the volume button and power button with OK feedback. It's a comfy phone. Also pretty good looking, but slightly slippery, which may bother some people. Now, on the hardware front, we're getting a 5.5 inch screen with a 1280 over 720 pixel resolution, an AMOLED panel and Gorilla Glass 3 protection. The CPU is an uh, octa-core one, MediaTek NT6753, clocked at 1.3 GHz. This chipset has a Cortex-A53 cores, it's a 64-bit processor, and we also get the Mali T720 GPU, as well as 1.5 GB of RAM in the Allview version, while the Johnny model has 3 GB of RAM. 16 GB of storage and a microSD card with support for up to 128 GB extra are here, 5 MP front shooter for the selfies, and the 13 MP back shooter as the main camera. On the connectivity front, we have uh, some uh, impressive setup here. Dual micro SIM slots, GPS, HD voice, FM radio, 4G LTE with up to 150 mega per second download speed. There is HSDPA with 21 mega per second downloads. 
and Bluetooth 4.0 as well as Wi-Fi, BGN, Wi-Fi Direct, Wi-Fi Display, USB Type-C and in the section we call Others, DTS Sound and the sensors available here are Accelerometer, Proximity Sensor, Light Sensor and Magnetic Sensor. So overall the hardware is pretty solid for a mid-ranger and now let's go to the battery. The battery we're getting here is a lithium polymer unit with a capacity of 3150 mAh. The charger bundled with the phone is a 5 volt or 1000 mAh of charger. So that's it, 5 volt, 1000 mAh charging up the device. On paper you should be getting about 393 hours of standby or 821 minutes of talk time. We don't let the paper speak, we did our own test. And our test involves HD video playback in a loop with Wi-Fi on and brightness of 200 lux and we achieved 10 hours and 47 minutes which is very good. We beat the HTC One M8 with its 10 hours and 15 minutes, Galaxy S6 with 9 hours and 49 minutes, Asus Zenfone Selfie with 10 hours and 11 minutes, but we score below the Galaxy S5 with its 11 hours and 4 minutes, iPhone 6 11 hours and 30 minutes and finally the Asus Zenfone to laser with 11 hours and 11 minutes. We also did a PC mark test which simulates continuous usage. A good score of 7 hours and 46 minutes. This time we beat the Samsung Galaxy S6 with 7 hours and 6 minutes, Galaxy S6 Edge 6 hours and 41 minutes and the Huawei Mate S with 6 hours and 26 minutes. Got beaten by the Allview P6 Energy with 11 hours and 24 minutes Asus Zenfone 2 Laser with 8 hours and 16 minutes and the Galaxy Note 5 scoring 8 hours and 6 minutes in the same test. The charging time for this Johnny handset is 3 hours and 14 minutes which is long but it's worth it for the previously mentioned results. At least it charges faster than the Evolio Neos 3 hours and 30 minutes, Xperia Z3 3 hours and 30 minutes as well or the iPhone 6 Plus 3 hours and 16 minutes. Obviously there are phones out there that are able to charge faster, like the Asus Zenfone 2, 1 hour and 50 minutes, Galaxy A5, 1 hour and 45 minutes, and the OnePlus 2, 2 hours and 13 minutes. Now in the settings area, you can find the special settings for the battery, that power manager here, with three main modes. So there is none, there is normal mode, that will use a dark theme, and we'll do the following things, turn off GPS, Bluetooth synchronization, adjust screen brightness and uh, change the standby time and CPU frequency. And then there's the extreme mode, which goes like this, black and white theme, only accessing the basic features like phone, contacts, messaging and clock. And supposed to extend the battery life by up to 5 times or even 10 times at some point. Other special options available here for the battery are the intelligent power saving at night, intelligent memory cleanup that pretty much speak for themselves and standby intelligent power saver. So pretty good battery aside from the charging. Now as far as the acoustics go, we have a singular speaker at the back here, small speaker and the music app will feel right at home if you've ever used a Xiaomi phone, it feels like MiWi quite a lot. Here's the player big icons, flat icons and quite a few options. We got common settings here, shake to change songs, some filters, equalizer and theme. We got a DTS option available here with special settings for the headphones and effects volume with presets like classic, dance, folk, heavy metal, jazz, pop, rock, user and this uh, uh, channel equalizer with five channels to play with in various frequencies and a slider to use if you really want to tweak the experience. Okay, and that's that. Those are the options you can play with. Now, let's actually listen to some tunes. Here we go. Okay, so as you just heard, there's some muffling on a flat surface. Other than that, 
we got a pretty okay volume it's actually pretty loud and clear good guitar and bass and uh, when you're listening to music you can actually turn up the volume uh, a bit over the maximum volume so here we go you just saw volume strengthening mode on so a little bit of extra kick from the speaker now let's see the headphones if you've ever seen a review for an all view handset this is it the same pair of headphones that we always find with this metallic area with this big rubbery tip they're comfy they have a nice look they have a wire that can tangle the remote is quite big and long but we don't mind that okay so connecting those here we are given some extra options in the player by attaching the headphones okay and it's time to view those extra options that are triggered thanks to the headphones so these are standard headset ears headset earphone headset soundbox and custom in the custom area you can play with dts focus true bass space definition and center courtesy of the dts technology now the actual experience when using headphones i have to say that could be louder but they have a good bass clear sound and excellent isolation from the outside noise since we're playing with the headphones I guess we might as well show you the FM radio, pretty basic user interface, search speaker and record FM and it finds station quite fast. Okay, so that's it about the acoustics and now let's see how the decibel meter did. As usual we use a decibel meter to measure the power of the sound and we had some pretty good results. At the back of the phone we achieved 90 decibels which is very good, however at the front the difference is quite big because we achieved 83.7 decibels, so about 7 decibels of difference. At least we beat the LG G Flex 2 with its 82.9 decibels, the OnePlus 2 with its 82 decibels, and uh, um, I feel that uh, we also beat the Asus Zenfone 2, but only with the 90 decibel value. That one achieves 87.6 decibels. Anyway, this is the third placed phone from everything we've tested so far. The record breaker was BlackBerry Passport with 95 decibels and then OnePlus One with 90.5 decibels. So this comes third with 90 decibels on the dot. However, you cannot maintain the same volume at the front at the back, but the acoustics remain solid. Now I want to talk about the display. It's an AMOLED. It's pretty crisp as you can see. It's a 5.5 incher with a 720p resolution and Gorilla Glass 3 protection. The video player is simply called video has a minimal interface and its options include DTS sound which you can see right here with this tag DTS we also have the aspect ratio option and something that feels like Samsung's pop-up play you can move the video around, keep doing your activities, open up the apps bit of lag appears but still you have pop-up play now the actual experience when using the screen what we get here is a bright display it's crisp, a bit oversaturated, the contrast is ok, it behaves well in sunlight and we got wide viewing angles. Uh, these are RGB stripe pixels we're dealing with, with a special setup. So let's see that, as usual we have a microscope and we zoom into the image to see what the pixels are like. So as I said before, RGB stripe with a special setup. Uh, for every blue pixel, there are two sub pixels, one green, one red, pretty much like on the Galaxy Note 2 and the all P8 Energy or the Johnny Marathon M5. Okay, we also have a lux meter test, so we use the lux meter, you can see right here, to measure the brightness and achieved 440 lux units, which is good. This means this is brighter than the Sony Xperia M5 that scores 430 lux. The HTC Desire 820 that scores 396 lux and the Huawei Honor 6 with its 383 lux. We score below the Huawei Mate S 455 lux, OnePlus 2 465 lux and the All UP Energy or the Marathon uh, M5 from Johnny with its 471 lux. Obviously there are special options for the display like brightness level, adaptive brightness, economical backlight, font size, wallpaper, sleep, LCD effect can be set to neutral, cool or warm, usually it's best to leave it on neutral, skylight and cast screen with skylight taking care of the special options when using a special case for the handset. So overall in spite of the resolution and the oversaturation it's an excellent display when it comes to brightness and uh, the colors also look pretty well. Time to talk about the cameras at the back, 
there's a 13 megapixel shooter right here with f2.0 aperture. We are promised 0.3 second focus and 0.46 second capture. This is a Samsung sensor, if you're wondering about the identity, is the S5 um, K3M2, so Samsung S5 K3M2 with ISO cell technology, it has an LED flash, 1.12 micron pixels and the sensor measures uh, about one third of an inch. It's the same camera that the Xiaomi Mi 4C has. At the front, 5 megapixel shooter and uh, in case you're wondering, the camera app opens up pretty fast, so let's see that. Reasonably fast, I would say. Not the fastest in the world, but also not a slug. So the interface is typical if you've ever seen an all view handset before with Lollipop. It's the same UI as always, pretty colorful with childish symbols and a lot of white text. So in the settings front we have anti-bending, guidelines, geotag, uh, there's picture size that can be 13 megapixels in 4 to 3, 10 megapixels in 16 to 9. Defaults and capture mode, touch, shot or normal, sound, volume, keys and that's that. Then we got the uh, front camera shortcut, the flash options, on, off or auto and the main capture modes. And let's start with smart scene that automatically adapts to the scene, be it HDR or night. Ultra pixel that's able to take 64 megapixel shots by interpolation. Pick note, it's useful if you're in a classroom and you see a notebook or book or the table where the teacher is writing and create a PDF out of it. Face beauty, it has its own options like uh, larger eyes, slimmer face, whiter face, and then filter, night and professional. That includes a bunch of sliders that feel a bit like the experience from the Lumia handsets or the LG G4. Anyway, exposure values can be set up, ISO up to 1600, options for the white balance, and options related to the shutter speed from the 30th part of a second to 14 seconds and uh, from macro to infinity focus can be tweaked. Magic focus it allows you to create a bokeh effect and create wonderful macros. Panorama, normal, take any time and HDR are also in the mix. Other than that you go to the video section, press settings, we got scene modes here night or auto, anti-banding, microphone exposure, white balance, anti-shake, geotag, you can film in 720p or full HD or lower values. Now the actual camera experience bring us an ok focus speed, changes focus reasonably fast, zoom is pretty fluid, goes up to let's say 4x, there's no indication of that, and uh, the capture is pretty fast actually very fast and the result doesn't look half bad okay we also have uh, these two things here the exposure and metering frame that we can move around as we please so that was the initial test now as usual we have a big gallery for you we've taken the camera outside we have over 100 shots selfies included and indoor shots included. I'm going to start off with the indoor shots. This was an HTC event with a bunch of phones shown off to the press and about 15% of the shots are blurry however those that actually made it look very very nice. Just check out the texture of the phone here. It's all because of the very powerful and very good flash at the back of the phone. Excellent texture here, good colors. Keep in mind it was total darkness in that room and using the flash we've taken a series of quite good shots. Some are blurry as I said and this is a burger, nice texture of the burger with flash. If you deactivate the flash this is what happens. As you can see it's quite blurry, unclear and it doesn't have that nifty texture anymore. Without flash, with flash, so if you're in a dark place in a low light area you should really use the flash. Now we move on outside, this is a gallery of shots taken in full daylight in December on a cloudy day. Ok, so the first shots reveal to us uh, pretty good lighting for a cloudy day. This color feels very artificial on the PC and on this screen too. The colors are pretty cold as the day was and we also did a test of the ultra pixel shot by uh, taking a picture of that fountain you can see here and you can really zoom into it as much as you want because it's a 64 megapixel shot so very impressive that's the starting shot and then you start zooming in 
a ton thanks to the 64 megapixel resolution achieved to interpolation. Some other images here, we have a pretty nice close-up of this flower that I'm actually using as the wallpaper on the handset right now. Excellent detail, so when it comes to close-ups, the handset can handle it. Now, an example of HDR, check out this monument, pretty dark, same monument, HDR on, a bit brighter but also feeling a bit more artificial. This camera can handle the text and the pictures pretty well when it's capturing them. And another attempt at a close-up with very nice metal texture here of this locket. Some more shots, decent colors but on the cold side, this is a panorama. Pretty modest resolution, 4640 over 1184 pixels. It's clear, it could be bigger and it feels a bit overexposed in the cloud area. When you're trying to zoom in, so regular shot, zoomed in shot, there is a clear quality loss. And once again, those colors may feel cold to some people, but they may feel realistic to others, so it's a mixed bag, these shots here. At least the quality remains quite good. Selfies, we also tried selfies, pretty good skin texture and the background isn't half bad. A landscape shot with surprisingly good details. I said before that when you zoom in the quality drops, I meant zoom in while taking the picture. If you do a landscape shot and then zoom in, you'll be surprised to see that there aren't many blurry details, which is always good. Some good colors here and there, nice wall texture, graffiti. Very nice close-ups yet again, probably poisonous fruit, do not eat that. If you see it and some more toys to enjoy us with cold colors, but good details. So good details again. And when it comes to close-ups and landscapes, the handset can handle them pretty well. I would go as far as to say that this model can beat the Samsung Galaxy S4 and my own iPhone 5 easily when it comes to quality. And my only objection would be the artificial HDR, some of the artificial feel of the photos and the cold colors. We also have videos which I'm going to find to the video app, three of them. So we filmed in MP4 format, full HD, 30 frames per second, and a bitrate around 14 to 16 mega per second. So video number one is this one. Let's take it from the start. A so-so exposure, pretty shaky. The colors look okay. And when you start to zoom in, there will be some quality drop, but we'll see that later on. So shaky, okay, clarity, realistic colors. Second video, this is the one with the zoom in. Not the best exposure in the world. Once again, shaky. The colors look okay. Keep in mind, it was uh, in the early afternoon, but it's December, so early afternoon may look like sunset. And now a zoom in test, dropping quite a bit of quality. And finally the last video, uh, once again too dark for 1pm, once again poor stabilization, good colors and quite okay clarity considering we're panning into a landscape view. From all the Allview and Johnny handsets I've tested, this is a bit above average for a mid-ranger, so filming is quite okay. In spite of the shakiness, I bet that activating that digital image stabilization will solve some of the problems. I'm remembered, I'm reminded, excuse me, of the Asus Zenfone 2 that disappointed us in the video capture area, and this feels a bit superior to the Asus Zenfone 2. Okay, so it's good for a mid-ranger, has great close-ups, great flash, and indoors you'll be very happy with it. Now if you want to do a bit of editing, pick your shot and do not press share, but rather press edit. Then we got the usual filters, crop, straight and rotate, auto color exposure, vignette, the works. Now I want to talk about the temperature and after playing the game Riptide GP2 for 15 minutes, we achieved 38.4 degrees Celsius, which means there's no overheating here, which is always good news. The web browser, this is the stock one, the pre-installed one, and let's access gsndone.com. It uh, loads pretty fast, 
it has a fluid scroll we got hot note here if you want to share links with another handset by bumping them and the virtual keyboard the stock lollipop keyboard is quite comfy now as far as connectivity is concerned this is the dialer of the handset and we got options like blacklist speed dial and uh, this is a dual sim handset that comes with 4g lte support hd voice and it has a USB Type-C port right here, which as I said before, this may or may not be Johnny's first USB Type-C handset, but for sure it's Allview's first USB Type-C phone. And as you can see, it's a reversible port and some people may like that, some people may not be impressed by that, anyway, it's innovation. Okay, so aside from this type of connectivity, we have Hotnot, there is no Wi-Fi AC or Wi-Fi A, there is no NFC, and the calls, well, they're loud, we have a good signal and they're pretty clear, so connectivity is covered pretty well. Now I'm here to talk about the benchmarks. I decided to compare this Johnny handset or this Allview handset if you want, with the HTC Desire 120, the Huawei Honor 4X and the Sony Xperia Z3. It's a battle of a MediaTek MT6753 plus 1.5GB of RAM versus a Snapdragon 615 plus 2GB of RAM and also versus the Kirin 620 from the Huawei plus 2GB of RAM and finally the Snapdragon 801 plus 3GB of RAM. In Quadrant we scored 22,489 points, we beat the HTC Desire 120 that had 20,058 points and totally beat the Huawei Honor 4X with its 5764 points. Surprisingly, we also beat the Sony Xperia Z3 with its 20358 points. In Antutu, let's see what score we got there. A pretty good 36565, beating the Desire 120 with its 31000 points, the Honor 4X with its 27000 points but scoring a bit below the Xperia Z3 and is 38,000 points. Nanomark is also here. In Nanomark we scored 57.7 frames per second, the HTC phone had 59.9, the Huawei phone 59.3 and the Xperia phone 59.7. Velamo is in the mix as well. And in the HTML5 test in Chrome we had 27.45 points. Meanwhile, the HTC Desire 120 had 23.90 points, the Huawei Honor 4X 18.41 and the Xperia Z3 27.71 points. Next up, there's also 3D Mark. And in 3D Mark, we scored a pretty underwhelming 600, excuse me, 6697 points in the iStorm Unlimited test. This is lower than the HTC Desire 120's 9276, but it surpasses the Huawei Honor 4X 5385. Of course, it's far from the Xperia Z3 16,688 points. GFX is in the mix as well, with a score of 19 frames per second in the T-Rex test, while the Desire 120 had 15 frames per second, the Huawei phone 9.1 frames per second, and the Xperia Z3 25.4 frames per second. Geekbench 3 is also here with 625 in the single port test and 28.19 in the multi-core one while the HTC phone had 666 here and 25.22 here the Huawei phone had 556 and 17.23 while the Xperia Z3 968 over 26.97 Speed test is in the mix too with 25 mega per second in download, 22 mega per second in upload, while the HTC phone had 24 and 21 respectively, the Huawei phone 21 and 21, and the Xperia phone 22 and 24. Some browser tests were also performed, like browser mark. 1362 is the score for this uh, Johnny handset. Well, meanwhile, the HTC Desire 120 had 1461 the Huawei phone 1187 and the Xperia Z3 1483. Some spider is up next, the lower the better and the score is high which is not very good. 1558 while the HTC phone had 1452 and the Huawei phone 1739. Um, the Xperia phone had the more uh, impressive score of 966, the lower the better. In Base Mark X we achieved 8370 points, which is certainly lower than all the rivals. All of them gravitated around 10,000 points or more, so they surpassed us. 
overall, this handset known as the AllView V2 Viper X beats the Xperia Z3 in 3 out of 11 benchmarks, it beats the HTC in 6 out of 11 benchmarks and the Huawei phone in 9 out of 11 tests. The benchmarks are quite okay considering the price tag of this handset that gravitates around 300 bucks or so. The phone doesn't suffer from lag, it has a fluid interface and it's able to run games like Walking Dead No Man's Land or Riptide GP2 without a problem. You can turn the details all the way to the max in Riptide GP2 and have fun with it without any sort of problem. Nice looking water, also nice effects, a crisp screen, and here we go. Pretty responsive, notice the lighting effect, pretty cool. Some water drops on the screen and that's it, that's the gaming experience in a nutshell, pretty good. Ok, now that we're done with the benchmarks and found them satisfying, let's see what software we're dealing with here. So this is Android 5.1 Lollipop with some customization. For example, the multitasking doesn't involve a carousel, instead it shows these thumbnails here and the quantity of RAM, you can close down all the apps by pressing that button, but uh, usually uh, you have quite a bit of RAM used up. Other than that, let's go to this area here where we can see the apps we can put on the screen and the widgets. Certainly, they're not typical lollipop stuff, so there's also customization here, some effects to apply for home screens. And now in the drop down area, you can see notifications, while in the swipe up area, you got the quick settings, much like on iOS. We got connectivity options, location, sound, brightness slider, and four. Shortcuts here to torch, fake call, calculator and camera. Ok, we go to the settings, we got connectivity features here, hot note included, no NFC once again, date and time, notification center, security, that includes encryption by the way, you can choose files to encrypt and save in a certain area, advanced settings, we got smart gestures here, that include the pause alarm, smart vibration and smart bright screen, so when the phone camera detects you're watching the screen, the screen can be maintained. We can also draw these symbols to open up certain apps from the lock screen when it's in standby mode and we got the suspend button floating around for a bunch of extra virtual buttons. LED light options available here as well, schedule power on off, accounts, accessibility and that's pretty much it. And now we have arrived in the area of pre-installed applications there's not much bloater going around here on the Johnny eLife S Plus. We got All View Self Care, B Defender Mobile Security, Browser Calculator, Calendar Camera, something called Chameleon that will take colors from the background and turn them into a wallpaper simply by relying on those colors. We got Chrome, Clock, Compass, Contacts, uh, Downloads, Drive, Email, Facebook, File Explorer, FM Radio, Gallery, Gmail. Google, Google+, Plus, Google Settings, Hangouts, Maps, Messaging, Music, Notes, Phone, Photos, Play Books, Play Games, Play Music and Play Newsstand as well as Play Store, Settings, Sim Toolkit, Sound Recorder, System Manager which may come in handy, it can clean memory, has an app manager, a power saver, traffic and an echo mode, System Update, Theme Park, Torch, Video, Voice Search, Weather and finally YouTube. Once again a fluid user interface, no bloatware, and these are things that we like. Now it's time for the verdict related to the Johnny eLife S Plus in a modified localized version known as the AllView V2 Viper X. So on the pro side it's a comfy tablet and has a good battery, a pretty loud speaker, a bright screen, it can take some good selfies and good close-ups, it has a pretty powerful flash indoors, there's no lag, we have a fluid user interface and as you can see there's no bloatware. On the con side, this is a slippery handset with a long charging, shaky videos, too little RAM for current standards and 28 nanometer chip that may not feel powerful in about a year or so, plus those clipses at the back that uh, take a while to get stuck together to keep the shell on properly. Ok, so overall a mid-range phone with a bit of quality here, known as the Johnny Elite S Plus or as the AllView V2 Viper X, 
I would have to say that the price tag will surely drop in the following months. It's just been launched in some parts of the world under the other name. Uh, a bit more RAM would be a better idea. So if you find it on other markets with more RAM, it's certainly a bargain on Amazon India. For example, it's available for about $250, which for this package plus 3 gigabytes of RAM, it's a very solid fit. A good thing here is that this handset does not sacrifice any aspect, battery good, screen good, camera pretty good and the speaker is also good so nothing big is sacrificed here. We don't give out grades anymore but overall this is in my book better than the HTC Desire 820 and derived Desire handsets. This is it from gsndon.com, bye bye.